What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny of Deljabar. What's up, Danny? How are you today? Chilling, man, as per usual. How about yourself? It is hot as hell. When it's we start there, doing when we start doing these episodes in the summertime, man, it gets hard because we can't have the AC on in the background. It fucks right. up the noise. So we have to uh, hunker down and go in a hot room and record this thing at night. Right now it's about 10.37 p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time on Thursday, the what, 3rd, June 3rd? 3rd, June 3rd. I really wish we had some of that Memorial Day weather while it was raining. What did you do during Memorial Day? Or Memorial um, Day weekend, excuse me. Yeah, it was it was pretty uh, pretty chill. Uh, I had a friend of mine's birthday, and then um, and then I uh, went bowling, which was fun, uh, and uh, that's about it. Very cool. How about you? Super cool. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> so I was in Boston over Memorial Day weekend, and it was fun. It's the first time I've ever been to Boston in my life. Believe it or not, I've I've never been to Boston either. How was it? The weather was terrible. I think the weather okay. was terrible for pretty much everyone on the East Coast, but I like the city a lot. Mm-hmm. It's it's beautiful. Um, you know, I, I for some reason in my head, I always thought Boston was a lot smaller than it than it, than it was. I thought it was just like a little town in my head, uh, but it turns out there's an actual little city there. But I enjoyed it. It's Boston, a great town. yeah, it's a major U.S. city. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's it's funny maybe, that you thought it was anything else. Maybe it's because I'm from New York and. You know, we're used to this like metropolis. Everything is right small here. in comparison. Yeah. Um, but no, I really I really enjoyed Boston, um, you know, minus the weather. But here's something funny. So, um, you know, I was in a a uh, cafe. And do you ever find yourself in moments where you hear people within an earshot talking about politics or talking All about the time. history? And you all, want to join in, time. but you know you can't because mm-hmm. that would be insane. That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Usually, where this I'm, time? usually, you know, where I live in in uh, Park Slope, Brooklyn, it's it's pretty, you know, lame. I'll just put it that way. The okay. nicest <laughs> terms, lame, lame. Mm-hmm. Almost. Um, but in Boston, I heard these guys talking about. Um, they were liberals. Let's just put it that way. Spoiler alert. Okay. But they were like kind of Democrat mm-hmm. liberals, like cla- like I don't say classic liberals. They were like Democrats. And uh, typical they liberals, were, right? Yeah, typical liberals. They weren't progressive. Mm-hmm. And I was mm-hmm. listening to them, and they were talking about um, this young journalist who was arrested in Belarus, uh, Roman uh, Protesevich, and right. they were mm-hmm. going on. I used to overhear them. They're talking about, oh, man, it's terrible. It's crazy what's going on in Belarus right now. How do they take this young uh, this, this young journalist, man? And, you know, they went on um, about Vladimir Putin somehow and then January 6th and, you know, typical things that, uh, you know, liberal Democrats discuss at lunch. And they mm-hmm. obviously seem like very nice guys. But needless to say, I wanted to butt in and be like, you know, share my opinion. But. Normal people don't do that, and they shouldn't do that. You should mind their right. own business. Right. Um, but did you fall? Have you been following this? Because we've been wrapped up in this Israel Palestine stuff that we never really had a chance to touch this, even though we we did some episodes on Lukashenko in the past. I mean, like I know the background, I don't know the details, uh, and so I'm I'm leaning on you to to kind of fill me in on on the specifics here. All right, so. Last year, a large protest broke out in Belarus after mm-hmm. the uh, most likely fraudulent election of Alexander Lukashenko. He won by 80%. And right. uh, we did an episode on that, actually. <laughs> it's called the last, dictator, the last Dictator of Europe. And that's what he's actually called. Right. You know, that's his nickname, right. the Last Dictator of Europe. He's been in power mm-hmm. since 1994. Um, it's fair to call him a bastard. He's not a good man. I think so. No. Right now, watch the other episode for that. <laughs> You'll find out why. Yeah. Well, right now, um, the the opposition to Lukashenko is probably larger than it's ever been, and therefore his crackdown on dissenters have been pretty brutal. Mm-hmm. And um, 
just to give you kind of a quick background on Belarus, um, it's it's basically the one country that did not go through the process of liberalization after the fall of the Soviet Union. So they rejected shock therapy, and most of their industry is still nationalized. Um, like shock, ther shock therapy was the program that was supposed to transition plan you know the planned centralized economies of the former soviet states to free market economies hence the word shock mm -hmm. it was supposed mm -hmm. to be a rapid change um what actually happened though was neoliberalism happened so you know former the former soviet owned industries were just purchased by a handful of oligarchs through government favoritism and cronyism and um needless to say it wasn't very popular and and Lukashenko was, you know, one of the few uh, ex-Soviet leaders who, uh, you know, rejected this. Um, you know, he continued to nationalize the major industries of Belarus. And for a long time, n not so much now, but for a long time, the living standards were better in Belarus than they were in, in Ukraine. Um, but mm -hmm. back to these protests, there is this Belarusian journalist named Rome, uh, Roman uh, Protesevich, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was yeah, the right. editor of a opposition telegram channel. So he would use telegram to organize protest. And you know what telegram is. Right. It's like, it's like what's up app. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what's app just with like encrypted messaging and, and some other features. So you can plan shit on telegram. Right, without the government it, knowing. Is that what Antifa uses, or is that what... Uh... Dude, I think everyone uses Telegram from uh, you know Antifa to neo-Nazis and everything in between. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's very, very democratic, you know? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anybody well, who wants to elude the... the isn't it Russian, though? Isn't government. it a Russian app? You know, I don't remember, but um, I, I know that the draw to it is that it's encrypted, so... You know, whether it's Russian or not, it's end to end. So only the intended users can actually see any of the messages. Gotcha. Well, I barely know what the word encrypted means, so I'm just not very good with it. Means with you can't see technology. it. <laughs> can't see it. Means you can't it. see it if you don't if you don't got the keys, you can't come in. That's what it means. Well, anyways, so uh Protestovich, this <laughs> this uh Belarusian journalist, he was put on a list uh, in Belarus. He was put on a list mm -hmm. of um, individuals involved in terrorist activity. So this, about a this week is the ago. journalist, right? Yeah. Do so we he was know put why on a he terrorist was... list in Belarus? Do we know um, why why he was uh, for, organ in for organizing activity? protests and for organizing riots and being an enemy of the state? I see. Okay, understood. Gotcha. Continue. Well, so about a week ago. Um, this guy was traveling by commercial airline from, I think, Athens to Lithuania when the Belarusian Air Force, they forced his plane to land. The flight was... Wait, uh, they, in they intercepted the plane? They forced his plane to land. It was... I'm not sure if it was fighter jets or what, or like it was just through airspace. I'm not exactly sure how this went down, but needless to say, um, the flight was diverted to Minsk the capital of Belarus, where this guy was arrested. So were they flying in Belarusian airspace at the time, or did they just like fly out to anywhere and be like, hey, you're coming to Minsk? You know, I'm we not 100% sure it. if it went over Belarusian airspace. I just know the plane hmm. was not scheduled, was not supposed to go to, to Minsk, and it was diverted to Minsk, and this guy was arrested. And this so is I don't a commercial know airline. This is a commercial airline, so I'm not entirely sure, okay. you know, if it violated the airspace or whatnot, or who who knows. But needless to say, it's bad. Yeah, it's that's not, not good. It's not no. good. No, it's not a no, good not thing to do. Now um, you're not you're not supposed to. I, I think there might be like international laws against fucking with like uh, like commercial airspace or commercial airlines. Yeah, like hundred percent. Well, the international community has condemned this. Uh, Anthony Blinken has condemned this. Um, obviously, this is condemnable, but it, it was condemnable just like when the U.S. Uh, pressured the the plane downing of uh, 
uh, President uh, Evo Morales of, of Bolivia when they mm. thought that Edward Snowden was on the plane back in 2013. That. that was wrong. That was mm-hmm. wrong as well. But yep. what's what's really interesting is that none of these corporate outlets that have been covering the story, or at least you know, I, I haven't seen any updates. You know, such as BB, the BBC and uh, New York Times and, and Guardian and The Guardian. Those are the main outlets I've seen covering this. Right. Uh, while, while, while covering this incident, they haven't really dived into this guy's past. And this guy's past isn't... It's, it's definitely writing material because this guy was a neo-Nazi before. <laughs> yeah, Protestovich was a yeah, neo-Nazi. Was. And not in the sense when liberals call Tucker Carlson a Nazi. This guy was an actual bona fide neo-Nazi. Now, careful with the Tucker Carlson. I mean, a lot of people get rolled up when you talk about him, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny, man. It's like, how can you be a neo-Nazi and be Belarusian? You know, the right? Nazis slaughtered. It seems counterintuitive, yeah. The Nazis slaughtered well over a million of them in World War II. Right. There's a great hymn about this called um, Come and See. It's a Russian, Belarusian film that came out in the 80s. Right. That's really, really good, even though it came out of like the right. Soviet, you know, the Soviet Union. It was a great film. Yeah, you keep getting me to want to watch it. I've, I, don't, I haven't been able to sit down and, and experience the whole thing, but one day. It's called Come and See, and uh, it's just about a boy who gets who's just experiencing the Operation Barbosa, the, the, the Nazi invasion of Belarus. And it's just very mm-hmm. gritty and it's uh, very moving as well. It's a very good film. It's very artistically done as well. Um, but, you know, the question that you're going to, that you should ask is like, what evidence do we have here? Like, how do we know this guy um is actually you know this far-right neo-nazi type um is this isn't Mm -hmm. that what russia usually says about any of their enemies i mean belarus is not necessarily a ally with putin they kind of are they're they have a weird relationship they work together but they're not lukashenko is not like um unconditionally pro-putin but the point is doesn't Russia just call any of their enemies like far right neo Nazis? Well, I feel like neo Nazis are just kind of like that target, you know. Anyway, I mean, they suck, but a lot that term you know it's used a lot. People so. have people have overused the term Nazi, so it's lost a lot of its punch over the past decade right. or so. Well, mm-hmm. there's a difference though from calling some you know random rednecks a Nazi and then calling somebody who who rocks swastikas on his shirt because protests of it. This guy, uh, Protisevich, he was a member of a very far-right militia called Young Front in Belarus. And mm. he had also volunteered to fight alongside the, the Azov Battalion in, uh, in Ukraine's uh, post-Maiden Civil War, which is a, a legend, that, most likely, certainly, a neo-Nazi definitely. <laughs> wing yeah. of their of uh, Ukraine's National Guard. And we have some nice pictures with him as well. So uh, we have this nice picture with him with his T-shirt. And this is visual. So we're going to post this on the YouTube so you guys can see these pictures of this guy. But we have... uh, We'll also do our best to to try and verbally describe what we're looking at here in case you don't feel like going over to YouTube. Um, we, we have let me actually one... let me actually share my screen yeah yeah why don't you do the the picture sharing okay here we are we're, we're looking at it henry we're looking at that first uh link that you put up uh and actually for you henry i'm going to share my my regular screen so you can see what i'm doing too give me a moment here Whew, hopefully my computer doesn't blow up from doing this um hmm how do I do that on the skizzy? All right. Henry, you should be able to see what I'm doing. Viewers, you should be able to see what I'm doing. Listeners, just pay attention. All right. So tell me what we're looking at here, Henry. We've got to hear a tweet 
Uh, and the tweet's caption says, Protasevic selfie in an explicitly neo-Nazi brand Svastone. It's extremely unlikely that one can wear these t-shirts without being, quote, in. And so it's a picture on the left-hand side of uh, Protasevich. Um, Protasevich? Protasevich? Protasevich. Whatever. Pro- pro- whatever. Protasevich. And he's, and he's wearing one of those one of those shirts, right, uh, from, from this brand, Svastone, which you can Google if you like. It's S-V-A-S-T-O-N-E. And it also appears on the right-hand side, uh, it looks like one of the stock images of one of their hoodies. Uh, and what we're looking at here, I can only describe this as like a swastika with extra steps. It kind of looks like it's four swastikas combined to make one big swastika. With, with, their, with their symbol in the middle. Right? With their with their uh, emblem, their vector emblem in the middle of it, but right. this is clearly a swastika. Like this is, I'm sorry, some images or some some symbols are just so poisoned that even something that remotely looks like it is not by accident. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? This is not an accident. This, these are swast these are swastikas. Well, I mean, and, I'm, I'm no des- I'm no designer, but even that center emblem, which is the emblem that they use all over their website and on their gear, that white thing right here, it's four lines intersecting with like little juts out on each side, and it's missing that last hook bit of a swastika. It's also got an open square in the center, but like, like all of these lines cr- are can be used to create a swastika in and of, in and of itself. It's emblematic. It looks like the center of a swastika. It is. It's a swastika. I don't know what to say. Like it's got all these extra looking legs here. I'm I'm looking at a swastika. I I concur. I mm-hmm. I believe that is a swastika. Um, and there's so um, the point is this guy's wearing this shirt. Right. He's wearing. He's a, wearing a shirt. By the with way, a bunch of swastikas on it. This, this, this guy's brand being, this guy's like being victim. Like, you know, in the New York Times and Guardian BBC, it's like. Oh, hello, right. far Russian crazy people are taking this poor man hostage. Again, right. I actually well, like, it's because they Even got whiplash from from the Khashoggi episode, right? You know, like like they're they're trying to be woke on on protecting journalists, but now they're inadvertently protecting a neo Nazi well, journalist. I don't. I think it's more than that. I think they just kind of group in Belarus with with Russia as the same as the same country, and they're just like, ah, oh, mm-hmm. look at these crazy. Eastern Europeans, um, but all right. I think that capturing a journalist is wrong. I don't. I think Lukashenko is a bastard. I I repeat. Mm-hmm. However, um, I think that you owe the audience a little backstory on the person, on who you're writing about. Like, I agree is with this that man. Oh, what? Do, hey, ooh, he's. Do a, you want to take a second to look ooh, at to look at that? this Fostone? Let's go to the um, yeah. Let's go to this clothing site called Spastone. What is Spastone? It's kind of like Ed Hardy, but for I was gonna say Afflicted. It looks like Afflicted. The, the Afflicted brand. You know, it's like it's like hardcore, whatever. Oh, let's go back to this dude. Look at this hardcore. guy. Hardcore. All right. It's so, kind of like an Under so, Armour. Yeah. It, it no, it's like, like a... purporting to be kind of like Under Armour e, but also like. Ed Hardy also like afflicted like or tap out or like you know think of those brands you know heavy graphic tees but I'm, I keep trying to like hold it on this one dude right here it's it's this this you know tatted up white dude standing in like on this beautiful background and he's wearing this like sleeveless shirt and on the sleeveless shirt Henry what does it say on this sleeveless shirt here I can't see you just read it out all right. It says white screen super small. on. Yeah, it says white, white on. on. White on. And the O on the on is like the on symbol. Um, and on to the right of it, it says, join the legend, Svastone Perun Company. And it's like, haha. And behind the white on is, is their symbol, which again is very reminiscent of a swastika. Not really sure what's up with this white thing. You might feel like I am being an uber liberal here and i'm reading too much into it but i, I kind of want to jump ahead a little bit henry i want to show the baby one because this one this one this one got me you want to do that 
Yeah, I'll pull up the baby shirt. Okay, so I'm on their website now. And we go into their little menu and we go into the children's section because, of course, they got swag for kids. Uh, and so I go to T-shirts and they got a bunch of little kids wearing some T-shirts that, you know, I don't know, on the face of it kind of look cool in, in one way or another. But, like, then you scroll down and you get to these two here and there's there's a girl's version and a boy's version. I'm going to pull up the boy's version because this one, this one got, like, internet famous here. It's a little white boy, um, and that's not necessarily important. But what's what is important is what's where, what the kid is wearing. Uh, the shirt is a white shirt with blue uh, um, uh, trim, let's call it, and blue text. And the text says in a circle, "White baby," and in the bottom of the circle it says, "The future of our race." And in the center, it's like it looks like a pacifier, but with brass knuckles. That's I think that's what I'm looking at here. Henry, does that is does that look like what it might be? And then like some olive branches around it because that's cool. And then to top it off, the two little swastika looking things, their brand. So again, I wasn't being extra liberal about this. This shirt literally says white baby, the future of our race. That's more than a dog whistle. That's that's Nazi shit, bro. That's that's explicit. <laughs> that's, that, that is, that that's is explicitly Nazi racist. <laughs> I mean, if it's not racist, it's definitely xenophobic, right? The future of our race. Who's us? Who's our race? It's the like whites. all over their website that they're like, here we can go to their about us. Let's read it because it's ridiculous. Um, let's see. This website's hard to about us here sorry fucking it up i'm gonna read it for you guys about us flutter the wings of mother sva and calls us to stand for our land as we are rusish standing on the stone where the runes of our victories are carved weave lace of the fate of our kind and harden the steel from which we forge our armor fucking weebs let these clothes protect and inspire you in battle Give warm in winter and cool in summer. Let these clothes be like armor of knights in glorious past, noble and strong. We inserted our soul in it. Flutter the wings of Mother Slava. And that's their entire About Us page. Sounds like it was written by like a fucking weeby dungeon master. No offense to the dungeon masters out there. No, that's actually how white supremacists talk. Like white separatists right. toss like that. No, I'm serious. Lame. If you ever hear them talk, they they um they love that type of imagery that you just listed, um like real ones, um mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean this is an explicit um, neo Nazi uh, clothing site that you know this guy is wearing a shirt of, and that's not the only evidence that we have right here. So there's, there's um, a ton of this shit. So there is another picture um can you click on the black sun or it says black is it sun this one? there's a link yeah that one yeah it's so, this one right yeah this is this guy on in full military fatigue with the azov battalion complete with the uh the the, the wolf angle or was a wolf angle wolf, wolf i'm so bad with german stuff the uh, wolf I angle can't read it all. uh it is the hold on let me pull it up wolf's angle it's a okay. wolf's angle. Mm-hmm. The wolf's angle um, that was used on the, the uh, SS Panzer Division. And um, there That's is... That's this thing right here, this this black thing right here. It looks like, yeah. like a swastika with a million legs, right? Exactly. And then there is the... All right. I mean, there's there's enough pictures. There's a bunch of shit. We you know he has the there's um the, the Azov Battalion symbol is the uh, what, the wolf one? angle emblem emblem that was it's it's all like you know Nazi imagery uh, back from the Third Reich. So, so okay, so these groups are co opting Nazi imagery or maybe dog whistling it or in some cases overtly uh, uh saying it and this guy who we're all led to 
you know, um, sympathize with because he's a j- journalist and, you know, the Belarusians did Again, something what, fucked what up. happened to him yeah. I think was wrong. I don't think yeah, it's totally that wrong. you should be he, arrested for being an opposition right. journalist, an opposition right. journalist. Right. Um, even if you're a Nazi. in that um, fashion. Which yeah, is, even uh, if you're a Nazi opposition journalist, as long as you're not doing anything wrong to anybody else, like, you know, that's not, it's, it's not inherently illegal to be a Nazi, <laughs> you know? But the question is, what's going on here? Why is the media playing softball with neo-Nazi groups? And right. I suspect the reason why is because these neo-Nazi groups are anti-Russian. That's the main reason why there's there's softball going on. And um, I want to pull this back to an episode that we, we did a few weeks back. It was on the origins of the uh, conflict going on between Russian separatists and uh, Ukraine. And uh, in the Donbass region, and we did the origins of the entire of the entire conflict, uh, you know, pretty much starting from the end of the Cold War on. Um, so we can't really go over the full conflict in this episode. So I reference that episode if you want the, the, the full history, the full picture, right? The mm-hmm. full the full picture. But in short, after the fall <clears throat> of the Soviet Union, Ukraine was left with a lot of complex problems. The main one right. being that the the borders of Ukraine, the present day borders of Ukraine, they don't really represent any type of real nation. It's kind of like an African state or a Middle Eastern state or whatever state that was basically created by European colonists. Um, you know, they're just lines kind of drawn over resources. But instead, mm-hmm. the boundaries of the the you know the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, they were established by Lenin and Stalin. And what they would do, especially Stalin, is that they would uh, export Russian speakers to the Soviet republics, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Soviet republics, in order to quash any type of national sentiment. Right. Um, Demographic sim- shifting, basically. To, to like simplify manufacturing this, manufacturing it. Yeah, to simplify this, you get a modern day situation where, in Western Ukraine. Um, they generally want to be part of the West and in Eastern Ukraine, they want a closer relationship with Russia. And fast forward to late 2013, uh, Ukrainians were forced to make basically a binary choice between either dependency on the EU or dependency on Russia because Ukraine was going through a horrible economic crisis. So they were trying to figure out who was the best person to, who would be better to bail them out. And there, I was going to say partner with economically, but yeah, bailouts sounds no, good too. No, it wasn't partner <laughs> economically because they would bring that. They're not a player that provides any value within the partnership. They need a bailout. So, um, oh, this Ukraine's is president that they can exploit. <laughs> so, yeah, um, Ukraine's president at that time, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you know, they. He rejected the association agreement with the EU, and he basically tilted towards Russia rather than going to the EU, and um, it ended up sparking mass violent protesting. And you're talking uh, about you, the the Euro Maiden, right? Yeah, and um, this eventually led to Yanukovych being ousted. And um, you know, I really have no idea of the tone of the initial protest that gather, gathered in, in Maiden Square. You know, I obviously am not a journalist. Um, I'm no expert on anything that we speak of, on anything that I talk about on this show, <laughs> just to let you guys know. Um, I think most of you are aware of, of that by now. So I have no idea of the tone of the initial protest that gathered there, um, you know, whether, you know, how peaceful they were. I'm sure you know, there was a lot of people who really, did demand and rightfully so uh, demand change because Ukraine's government is corrupt. It's just, it's like, if you think America is corrupt, just go to look at a country like Ukraine. They're basically just salespeople. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can say the same thing about us as well, but they're more corrupt and they're poor. That's that's what I guess makes a bigger difference because people really suffer (laughs) and have consequences, like really bad consequences. Um, but 
what I do know is that any type of uplifting mood um, they that, that the group had or that the protests had, it changed once Ukraine's opposition parties hijacked the movement. So, you know, there's all these different political parties that, uh, you know, oppose, you, you know, <clears throat> Yanukovych. Um, I have a hard time pronouncing Yanukovych for some reason. There's a lot of different... <laughs> Tough one. I know. Um, but, um, you know, so parties like... Um, the, the main one was the, the Ukrainian Democratic Alliance for Reform. And then you have uh, Fatherland. Mm-hmm. And then the Right Sector. And uh, most famously, Svoboda. Yep. So Svoboda... Uh, that means freedom. In yeah. Ukrainian. Mm-hmm. Well, Svoboda is, is especially. Sp- well, <laughs> Svoboda is especially interesting. Right. They were founded in 1991 as the Social National Party of Ukraine. So Get it's it? Come again. The the what? The Social National Party of Ukraine. The Social National Party of Ukraine. So mm. Social National National Socialist. You mm-hmm. get it. It's kind of a mm-hmm. wink, wink. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so basically, Svoboda, they idolize uh, Stefan Bandera, who fought with the Nazis during World War II. Um, Hitler actually wanted Bandera to, um, he wanted his group to police Ukraine after the Germans took over. And Bandera, Stephen Bandera and his, you know, his uh, nationalist group, they participated in the Holocaust. They killed a lot of Jews. Um, yep. yep. And 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 his so his story is super interesting because of how much it flips back and forth. And I want to take a second to, to talk about these guys because again, we're talking about a uh, a group Svoboda who idolized this dude, and he is definitely a troubling figure in Ukrainian history, or at least a controversial one at best. Um, so he, he was born 1909. Um, he was a, uh, he, I guess the best way to put it is like, he was a, uh, like a politician, a Ukrainian politician, but m- more importantly, he was the brainchild of, of very far right wing organizations. Um, specifically the, uh, Ukrainian nationalist, uh, uh, the organization of U- Ukrainian nationalists, uh, the OUN. Uh, and you know, he was, like you said, Henry, involved in, in a lot of terrible shit, including terrorist uh, activities and participating in the Holocaust. Um, but just to kind of get some backstory for this dude, he was born in, in Poland when it was partitioned. Um, it was technically the Kingdom of Galicia, which I had never heard of until reading about this guy. It was At the time, it was a part of um, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and then after World War I, uh, it flipped back to it went to West Ukraine for a bit. Um, those but then those after, borders they flipped constantly at that yeah, time. Yeah, they, they, they flipped. So there's back a lot of hatred. Lot. There's a mm-hmm. lot of there, there's a lot of hatred in Poland uh, on on Bandera, right? Because Bandera uh, and this, initially and this was is anti, why it was anti Polish, right? And this is why because check this story out. So you know the place that he lived flopped back and forth between Poland and Ukraine a lot in his life and during that switch up he became kind of radicalized specifically there's this one story where uh he wanted to go to czechoslovakia to study like to go to school and the polish authorities didn't let him go uh so i guess he got mad and he went somewhere else to school and then he organized in that school uh a ukrainian like ultra nationalist organization well let me let me cut you off who else mm -hmm. couldn't study at the school he wanted to (laughs) <laughs> sir sir hitler m- yeah. mr mr adolf yeah mm-hmm. so right, this sorry dude for interrupting you no 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 you're fine uh that's a good that's a good parallel to draw uh so this dude uh you know he 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 goes to a different school because he wasn't allowed to go to the one that he wanted to in czechoslovakia uh so he creates all these ultra uh ultra nationalist um like pro ukrainian national uh organizations and and they did some fucked up things in the name of Ukrainian nationalism. Um, specific, oh, excuse me. Specifically, uh, he and this group were responsible for the assassination of Poland's minister of the interior. This dude named Bronislaw Piraki. 
And that was in 1934. And uh, yeah, Bandera got in trouble for that. He was actually sentenced to death. Um, but they commuted his uh, term to just life in prison um, instead. So he, he evaded the axe, um, but he got stuck in prison for life. And this was in 34. Uh, so we're just talking about like rise of Nazism in Germany. So he's stuck around in, in jail for a bit. And this is where this is where it gets pretty interesting. So he's in jail for assassinating the interior minister. And then he catches a lucky break. And, and that's in 39 because uh, the Germans and the Soviets both invaded Poland at this time. And this was like the start of World War II uh, when they were starting to fight each other and, and Poland and, and the surrounding areas became like the battleground. Uh, and as a result, they ended up letting him go. Uh, I didn't actually read who specifically, so you, my apologies for not getting that detail. Um, but he gets out is the point. Uh, so the rumor. I, I think the Nazis were the ones who let him go. Okay. Let's go I've with read that. this story. So the Nazis I, let him I, go. I, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I've read this story before. I'm pretty sure it was the Nazis who let him go. Okay. Because they let's, knew let's that go he was going to be an anti, because he would he would be a resource in Ukraine fighting the Soviet Union. That's why they 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 banded with them. Well, we'll hold that thought because this is interesting. So let's let's assume that it was the the Nazis for a moment. So the Nazis let him out, right? And then he ends up going to Krakow in Poland, right? But in the German occupied zone of Poland, right? Um, and this is where Bandera starts linking up with a bunch of Nazis, right? This is where he starts like, um, yeah, obviously cavort, it was most them. likely the Nazi. If he immediately starts linking up with them right after he's let out of prison, like the Soviet right. Union probably would have killed him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, no, he was I in mean, the German he's anti, he's zone, very so. anti-Soviet. It probably would have killed him. Of course, because, because he wanted to be, you know, he wanted Ukrainian independence from the Soviet Union. So obviously yeah. he was diametrically opposed to the Soviet Union. And in particular, the types of Nazis. And also, that he was and also like, I don't want to cut. I don't, sorry, I don't want to. No, you, you add a little more color. Um, Go ahead. Th- there have been Ukrainian uh, groups fighting the Soviet Union for a while since 1919, right. mm-hmm. like the so Free Cossacks. Way before, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, Soviet. The Soviets nothing were new. allergic right. to those to those groups. They would have killed right. them. Right. So it had it had so to be that was the only place he could go to stay alive. Yeah, basically. Um, okay, so he, he's he's in Poland still. He's in Krakow in German control, links up with some Nazis, and then the Nazis in particular that he was hooking up with uh, were ones that were kind of like okay with Ukrainian independence. At the very least, they were okay with it because they thought it was like a use, like you said, a useful tool to fight off the the um, the Soviets in in Ukraine. And who knows it better than the people that live there, right? Um, so you skip forward a little bit. Uh, you know, in I think it was forty one uh, when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, um, the Soviets actually start pulling back. They start retreating, uh, and Bandera and his buddies they think, oh shit, here's our chance, right? We can get you know Ukrainian independence now with these Nazis' help. Uh, oh, uh, by the way, I have to point this out. Um, th- at this point, there were two OUN groups, so the um, the ultra nationalist Ukrainian groups. Uh, there was the OUN. M, which was supported by a political figure named uh, Andre Melanik, uh, and OUNB for Bandera, that was supported obviously by Bandera, and it's just pretty well known that the Bandera group was known to be the more radical of the two groups. But go figure, you know Bandera was their leader. This dude assassinated a, a Polish minister of interior. Like, yeah, he's of course he's going to be the crazy one. So Bandera. Uh, so it was back to the Nazi story. Uh, the Bandera, um, uh, along with his group, the OUNB, they they put together this um, this thing called the Proclamation of Ukrainian Statehood, which was kind of like a declaration of independence, if you will, but also Bandera pledged loyalty to Hitler at the same time. Uh, so there was that part, you know, pretty overtly, you know, Nazi alignment there. But the ironic part about all this is that a couple days later, after after the Germans take over, uh, they end up the Gestapo. They sent the Gestapo on them. They sent the Gestapo to round up Bandera and the rest of the OUNB leadership, and they either killed him, killed them, or they sent them to concentration camps. And Bandera actually ended up in Sachsenhausen, the concentration camp. So the dudes that he was linking up with to get help to do Ukrainian. <laughs> uh um independence ended up not like like turning on him and throwing him again in a prison um 
in, in, a in a concentration camp, no less. And this is after, by the way, I've skipped so many details. This is after he did terrible fucked up things, you know, uh, uh, you know, to Jewish people, to, you know, Poles, to you name it. Like he massacred people during that time in, in you know, alongside the Nazis. Um, so, but, but there's still more twists to this story, which is crazy. So, uh, spoiler alert, the Nazi invasion didn't go very well in the Soviet Union. Um, it didn't go very well for the Nazis at least. And so they start pulling back the Nazis. Uh, and they ended up releasing Bandera again from the concentration camp, uh, and a bunch of other OUN folks, cause they thought it would be useful, uh, again in fighting off the Soviet advance. And cause you know, they, you know, I guess the, the idea was that Bandera should hate the Soviets more than they hate the people who just put them in concentration camps, I guess, which is weird. <laughs> That part doesn't make a ton you know of what sense. What Bandera sounds like? He sounds what? like a like a, an equivalent to Al Qaeda. Yeah, totally. Like an 100%. American Al Qaeda, like how like the Nazis, like a Ukrainian like Al Qaeda. US yeah, will conveniently use Islamists to fight wars. That they, right. You know that they don't want to. That... But then they'll turn around and bomb the shit out of them with a drone. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Totally. That's what. That's Same what. Idea. Just kind of like cannon fodder that. It's just being yes, used 100%. for political aims. That is that is exactly what was happening here, right? But, you know, I guess to Bandera's credit, he persisted like a fucking cockroach. And he kept working towards Ukrainian independence. And eventually what he ended up doing is, uh, you know, after World War II, uh, uh, he ended up settling in West Germany, um, where wildly enough, he ends up being like an ally to all these like major anti-Soviet groups and British intelligence agencies. So, like, now he's working with us after doing the Holocaust? I mean, I guess that's not so crazy to think about. I mean, we, we scooped up a bunch of Nazis like Werner von Braun and <laughs> brought them over to the United States to, to make our rocket program. But still, it's just, still, it just leaves, like, such a weird taste in your mouth, right? Um, yeah, we also pardon a lot of Japanese war criminals as well. That's right. That's right. So it's super weird, right? But, you know, par for the course, I guess. Anyway, 14 years later, uh, after the war was over, he gets assassinated by KGB agents with nerve gas. <laughs> so go figure. That's, you know, that's how they off people. Uh, so I think his story is crazy as hell to follow. And it's also very crazy when you put it into a modern context, because when you when you poll people on, on people's opinion of of uh, Bandera, and I mean specifically like Ukrainians uh, and some Polish people and things like that, you get so many wild, wildly mixed opinions about him, depending on who you ask. So, you know, on the one hand, some people will kind of, you know, they look at him as a fervent freedom fighter, right? You know, whose goals were to, you know, find independence for Ukraine at any cost and like, you know, pitting himself wholeheartedly against the Soviet Union. And, you know, maybe they overlooked the point, the fact that he aligned himself with the Nazis to do it. Um, but, you know, in, in certain circles, especially, you know, um, a lot of these Western European, excuse me, Western Ukrainian circles, that's, that's kind of the idea of Bandera. He was kind of a hero. And on the other hand, though, he's straight up racist, xenophobic, and a terrorist who carried out political assassinations and massacred countless poles and a bunch of other shit and yeah he he did the holocaust like he he was an he, he was, he an was active... a participant in the in right. um i think about what six thousand uh the deaths of around six thousand jews yeah, yeah and he's he's a bad he's a bad he, corn pop's a bad dude he's a bad dude um no he's not he's not a great man he does not have a great track record but I guess he's right. uh, I guess he's interpreted interpreted within Ukraine as having more of a complicated history, whose heart was in the right place. Can you hear right. me? And yeah, I can hear you. You sound a little bit robotic for some dumb reason, but I can I can deal with it. Do I sound a little bit robotic? It's it, no no no. It's it's definitely a a. Don't worry about it. Don't click no buttons. I'm looking at the levels. It looks fine. I don't okay. think it has anything to do with. Sorry it. if I sound it's robotic, like people. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, you know, kind of like the Vlad the Impaler type character, the Transylvanian hero, but also seen as a genocidal maniac at the same time, Vlad the Impaler. Right, 
right. You know, exactly. he's seen as a hero very, very, very of, of uh, being a bulwark against the, against the Ottoman Empire. But at the same time, this is a guy who allegedly would you know torture people for fun and fillet people like a real life Ramsey Bolton, just a sicko. Right. To- uh, but totally, he's also totally. a hero in some regards. Um, right. And for and what for what to he that did. point on. To, to that point on the hero bit, like you, you probably guess that, you know, if if he was actually given the title posthumously, the the hero of Ukraine, and you would think that because of the mixed responses that people have for him, that this would stir up the pot a bit, which it did. Uh, and that's what, um, you know, uh, uh, Yushchenko did. So the, the prior uh, president of Ukraine, right before he left he, in, in 2010, he awarded Bandera this like very prestigious prize like the the medal of honor or medal of freedom that we would give out you know um and so that that definitely stirred up the pot and just kind of bringing it back to you know why we started you know this this whole rant on bandera svoboda which is a you know social national party of ukraine loves this guy loves this guy like the current neo-nazi uh i said nazi funny Nazi. <laughs> the current neo-Nazi um, party is just like in love with him, and you know, align totally with you know his methods and and you know with the bullshit that he did, and that's what's going on right now in Ukraine. Do you want to hear about the play that Svoboda did after the Euromaiden? Did you ever hear about their play, their little production? Oh yeah, the the one at that New Year's Eve party or whatever. Yeah, so this is a very, I don't want to say funny, but it is extreme. So on New Year's Eve, so after the Euro Maiden, um, so New Year's Eve 2014, Svoboda had a little production at the at the main stage. And mm-hmm. the play, and this production, it was about the birth of Jesus. But it also, it combined, uh, I guess, contemporary Ukrainian politics. So you have, you know, the birth of Jesus with, you know, the current political situation that's going on to make it, you know, super relevant. And right, keep people awake. <laughs> yeah. The lead role was uh, was actually played by a, a parliament leader from Svoboda. And uh, he played the at he his character was uh, Zed, and um, I'll leave Zid. it up to your imagination of what that means. But I think you Zid. get it. The Zed, mm-hmm. Zed, the Zed, and um, so apparently he was he was um, doned in um, like black garb and he was wearing side locks, and um, oh, so he was Jewish, like the Zed. Orthodox Zid Jewish. is Zid is a derogatory word for jewish people in russia Mm -hmm. so it's a very derogatory word um now i feel bad for saying it (laughs) well that's the 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 point i'm getting to right now and this was never this was not covered and i swear to god i did not i only heard about this this story um because i was listening to scott horton years ago and justin Ramondo covered this story this is back in like 2000 this is obviously back in 2014 and mm-hmm. I looked it up. I couldn't find any of this. I was like, "What? What are they talking about?" Like, I can't find any information on what on what they're talking about right now. Finally, I found it in the Jewish Telegram Agency, and mm. it's true. Like what they said was true. These guys put on this like this anti-Semitic pageant, and um, I'm going to read from the. I brought this this article up from the Jewish Telegram Agency, and um, see Zid explain to the crowd that he is involved in various occupations including banking stock market speculation loan sharking and hosting a talk show <laughs> that's the worst one <laughs> the jewish oligarch character sings gleefully east and west belong to me our people are our everywhere um, Zid creates problems for the newborn Jesus and contemplates taking a bribe from a character revoking both y- Yanukovych and King Herod to help him crush the protesters. Fascinatingly, the Jews switch his sides and joins the opposition when he learns that on the orders from the king, 
the regime's forces are preparing to kill Jewish firstborns. The audience is given to understand that the shift in loyalty is due not to a belated outburst of conscience, but rather because Zid is worried the regime may turn on his own people. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, so that's that's it, it totally was, not a neo-Nazi play, right? It's a, it's, it's a neo-Nazi play. <laughs> and what what's really interesting <laughs> yeah. about this, um, it's, a, it's just shocking, because imagine if something like that happened in the U.S. In 2014, like a, no less, right? Like Even yeah. in 2014. This wasn't like... 20, 2021 yeah, this, now the world would explode but i mean even in 2014 it seems like so long yeah, I mean, ago we're not talking things about like were 50 less years ago <laughs> correct yeah i mean that that obviously would be you know that would be maybe that humor can get you can get away with that humor maybe in like three different shows and that's south park south park Chappelle family show. guy <laughs> and always sunny in philadelphia they seem to have a pass yeah. on how offensive they can be um yeah. But, I mean, that, it's it's clearly, you know, I don't want to use the word pro- problematic, because, that, ugh, but um, it's not good. Um, but the, the reality was, for the first time since 1933, Hitler lovers entered a European government. And yeah, this was only a coalition government, but... The Nazis, the actual Nazis in Germany, were also part of a coalition government that had, you know, other members of that government they thought that could, you know, tame them or contain them. And, and, you know, they needed them to eventually fight the Soviet Union. And, you know, it's kind of the same mentality that happened or the same thing that went on in 2014 in Ukraine, you know, where Mm -hmm. these uh, other political parties, they... um, join forces with these really far right kind of scary fascist parties, you know, because they wanted a bull worth against the Russians, which is it, you're creating a monster. You're creating a Frankenstein monster when you deal with these groups. And, um, you know, I want to talk about these, um, cause you know, we were talking about, we let off talking about the Azov battalion and, and um, I'm going to take a moment to actually talk about these 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 um, volunteer battalions in Ukraine, because you know, as I mentioned before, ordinary Ukrainians taking up arms to fight is nothing new. You know, we were talked about the free so- the Cossacks um, who fought mm-hmm. against the Soviet Union, um, Ukrainian paramilitary groups fought against Poland, Germany, and the Soviet Union all throughout the mid 20th century. Um, after, so going back to 2014, after Crimea voted to join the Russian Federation, you know, when, when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula and fighting broke out in the Donbass region in, in April of 2014, Ukraine's armed forces were awful. They were terrible. They were mm-hmm. useless. They stood by and watched everything go down. That's right. They didn't mm-hmm. do anything. And um, they were so bad that, Poroshenko had to outsource the nation's defense to volunteers. And the people who volunteer for these wars, and this goes for the people who volunteer for basically any of these wars, including the wars in the Middle East, like in Syria, um, in Yemen, and in Soviet Union, uh, I mean, not Soviet Union, excuse me, in Afghanistan, um, it's a collection. Soviet, right. It's it's a collection of the world's biggest losers who join these groups. Um, and I found this article from on the National Interest from Alexander Clapp, and it's about these. He went there and he was talking. He was just writing about his experience interviewing different different people in these groups and these different. Uh, people who travel abroad to fight with people in Azov because again, um, you know, going back to this, to this young journalist, uh, Roman uh, Protasevich, he was a volunteer, you know, he's not Ukrainian, he's Belarusian. So he traveled to Ukraine to uh, join the Azov battalion. Um, But let me pull this baby up. 
So he goes on, he writes about how, you know, there are Chechens who were fighting there. Um, and, you know, the some of the Ukrainians were ultra nationalist. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of different people who were joining these volunteer. It wasn't um, uh, totally exclusive to, to those types. There was a lot of people around the world who were joining these volunteer armies because this volunteer army grew to like 15,000 or so in about two months. But quoting him, most members I met were foreigners who joined because Azov, allegedly funded by Renet Akhmetov, a Donetsk steel tycoon, pays $500 per month. So, you know, that's, that's, that's something that a lot of mercenaries will do is that they'll just join war efforts for money. That's what right. you have in in Yemen. A lot of the, a lot of the Self troops that Saudi Saudi Arabia was using, were from the Sudan and from Africa because they're in desperate poverty in the Sudan, and this is an easy way to make money. Um, so they join militia groups. Um, but I mean, I'm not surprised to here that is an incentive to join um you know paramilitary groups in ukraine um but going back if there is a shared sense of mission among the volunteers it may be best described as anti-putinism almost every volunteer i have met this winter at the donetsk front donetsk front bears a personal grudge against him so um i mean I guess that that's pretty self-explanatory uh, but right. this this is interesting because this goes into um, again about the funding of these battalions or these uh, these volunteer groups. Battalions acquired heavy guns by way of a of a handful of oligarchs who lavished their pocket armies with the best equipment can buy. Many have so anti air. Like... Oh, go ahead. Go... No, no, go ahead. Continue. I'll just continue reading. Many have anti-aircraft missiles. Azov Battalion, but, <clears throat> excuse me, Azov Battalion has access to a tank factory. The Dinapro-1 Battalion operates heavily armored vehicles and drones and fires Swedish-manufactured sniper rifles. So basically, this is like the the Ukrainian Golden Company, right? Like it's just financed by you know. Some oligarchs who, you know, basically want want to swing the uh, outcome of a battle in, in their direction, so they heavily outfit them, right? Yeah, they're they're Ukrainian oligarchs who are who want to have closer ties with with Western countries rather than Russia, who are who are funding it, who are basically bankrolling these groups, right? Because those that, are the primary financiers. Because there's a lot of, um, I forget the name, uh, yeah, Akhmatov. He is the, um, man, he's one of the richest people in the world, Akhmatov. He's like, got to be like in the top 100. He's a bill, He's a multi, multi-billionaire. A lot, I mean, mm. a lot of these, after the On Soviet the Union fell, we, I mean, we, talk, we, we always talk about this, but after the Soviet Union fell, there, there was a select few people in, you know, in Ukraine and Russia who made billions and billions of dollars just through cronyism. That's right. Steel that's right. tycoon, meaning he owns the steel. He owns steel industry. Like, that's what happened. Right. Like, these people just bought industries, not companies. They the entire industry. national industry. <laughs> yeah. And um, they become they became un, just ridiculously wealthy. And it ended up being a very bad system because it wasn't like, you know, they were competing in marketplaces or anything like that. They just were acquiring their wealth through just flat out plain old corruption. And that's why, you know, the, the, and I just want to be clear before we go anymore. I, I, we are far from trying to like label Ukraine as like a Nazi society at all. Like that's not the case we're trying to build. I hope people get that. Um, that's not, yeah, I think it's important. It's to, I think it's totally important to make that distinction. It's just, I think what's important about bringing up this Nazi element is to to show how, I don't know, how nuanced the situation is, right? I think Stepan Bandera is a really 
good microcosm example for what's going on. It's like on the one hand, you know, there are people who rightfully want freedom and self-determination and, you know, uh, like to, to be their own thing. But on the other hand, there's some troubling elements and aspects of it. And it's like, how far are you willing to go to get what you want? You know, uh, and, you know, there's, there's definite parallels, you know, what do they say? History, uh, uh, rhymes, it doesn't repeat. So, you know, the fact that, you know, the Ukrainians have to rely on ultra nationalist neo-Nazi groups to, you know, defend themselves from Russia again, uh, is kind of, it sounds like the same story over and over again. Well, the lesson that I'm I, I I completely understand that and I think that's a good point to make. The the lesson that I'm the main lesson I'm gathering from this story is that the West will work with anyone to achieve a desired outcome, desired political outcome in a different region. Including, yeah. so I'm putting this more in the boat as like working with crazy is like just crazy jihadists to overthrow a government. Like that's that, right. that's the lens that I'm looking at this in. You know, we'll work with Islamists to throw over to overthrow a secular dictator, and we're going to work with Nazis as well to overthrow. You know, a guy who is more in line with with Russia than we want him to be. Because Yukashenko or wasn't how- even. Oh, excuse me, um, Yanukovych was not even like super pro Russia. Like he was just not totally anti Russia. A lot of almost all of Ukraine's leaders, you know, none of them are. After the Soviet Union fell, none of Ukraine's presidents, none of them were like outright like pro Putin guys. They all were just kind of like. You know, they were kind of pragmatic where they knew they had to deal with them. They knew that they had to work with Putin. Kuchma was probably the most. Uh, I mean, here's the thing about Yanukovych is that Putin directly helped with his election in 2004. And That's right. The election was pretty fraudulent, you know, like mm-hmm. it wasn't it was a pretty kind of bogus election. The election, the last election, though, he won in 2010 was real like it was like it was there was enough observers and stuff like that to kind of conclude that there was no fraud and it was like by a pretty close margin too it wasn't like you know wasn't like Assad's last it uh, wasn't like Assad's <laughs> last victory winning by 95 yeah. was it 95 percent 95 94 or something like was that 95 percent yeah. it wasn't like one of those um but um where was I in this article because there's a a uh a fulfilling point that I found in here that I want to make sure I get to. Um, so this guy goes on. I've met former drill instructors from Israel and Western Europe assisting in battalion training camps. Uh, right sector occupies a unique place among the battalions. And right sector is kind of is is like the you know the political wing uh, that Azov Battalion operates in. Um, mm-hmm. Its origins were neither wholly territorial nor ideological, but a blend of the two. A series of nationalist organizations and armed groups, Trident, the Ukrainian National Assembly, the Patriots of Ukraine, coalesced during maiden protest. The group is rumored to have been funded by the Kremlin in its earliest days, but its most prominent financer today is a Jewish industrialist named Igor Kolomoisky. Many Ukrainians call right sector his personal army, through Kolomoisky himself denies any connection to the organization. Wait, stop right there because I'm I'm a little confused because this is crazy. Or if if I've read this correctly, this ultra right neo Nazi group has been previously funded by the Kremlin, the Russian side, right, and then later by a Jewish industrialist. Yeah, just the but, Jewish and yeah, but they're a neo-Nazi group. Well, listen, man. Um, apparently, I mean, I, I looked at, I read Max Blumen, Blumenthal stuff, and 
you know, the gray zone and other people have reported that Israel has covertly armed and funded um, these these groups in Ukraine. But I mean, Israel does the same thing with a lot of Islamist groups that hate. You know, well, I mean, we, that don't we like brought Jewish that up in people our... either. It's the government. We... <laughs> but no, I don't know yeah. the the personal. I don't know the. Um, I mean, that's not the state of Israel right there. That's just some oligarch. I don't know what his motivation is, but um, yeah, to enough. fund this, but it's probably more so for. And he also de- uh, he also denies any connection to the organization too. So yeah. it's like all al- alleged, but still kind of an interesting twist. I do know that in the Jewish in that Jewish Telegram article that. I read there was there was another articles written around the same period where um, the where um, the I'm not sure if it was the Israeli government or if it was like a Jewish organization within Israel, but they were warning Ukrainians to they were giving like a kind of a warning to Ukrainians to to uh, be careful and you may have to flee or something like that. I might be hmm. kind of doing the story wrong they're saying it was getting pretty bad in there um there's a lot of anti-semitism brewing up there but you know i don't know the full story on this um or the uh complete uh motivation for funding and arming these groups i can you know i, I kind of have a grasp of like the grand kind of nation to nation stuff but the personal profit stuff uh, that's a whole different ball that game one gets of murky. research that yeah. needs that that would need to go into to, you know what deal and what you know who's benefiting from you know of a of a who's benefiting benefiting from you know Ukraine joining the EU or severing ties from Russia and, and this and that and that I mean it's research that's possible to do it's just research that takes a lot of time and you know it's that's actually a lot scarier research to do to be completely honest because you know Jeffrey Epstein obviously didn't commit suicide. <laughs> yeah. To do reporting on like personal billionaire oligarchs is, is, uh, is like, uh, I feel like if you are a journalist, like that's the way to get killed. <laughs> that, that type <laughs> yeah. of reporting. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I digress. Um, so let's see. Where the hell? Was I? Uh, oh yeah, you're I met with right, classically right fascist there, as is con- is it, so I met I met were classically fascist as it, as is commonly supposed. They often spoke scornfully of Nazism, were open to non-white and foreigners joining the organization. So he, this guy is saying that, and who was reporting there, he's saying the guys that he met in the right sector, so the military wing, didn't like Hitler, didn't really you know like Nazism, and they were fine with with non-whites joining the army because remember that jihadists were joining this battle. I don't know if I mentioned mm-hmm. that earlier, but jihadists right. joined the side of the Azov battalion. And some of them for, were from Chechnya, but you know, others were, I mean, obviously even Chechens just, you know, experienced discrimination in other parts of Russia and Ukraine. But, um, you know, obviously they're not Christian, you know, they're, they're most likely Muslims. And, um, you know, jihadists from other parts of the Arab and Muslim world came who are not white, who joined the army there. So they were accepted. So, you know, I don't think that a lot of these guys were, you know, absolute ideologues, as we would say, just like how a lot of people in ISIS or a lot of people in, um, these military wings in the Middle East, they don't really know the Quran that well. They don't, they're not Islamic scholars, you know, they're there just fighting for fight for fuck. You know, they're fighting for fuck's sake. Um, again, for a lot of them dollars a month, I, <laughs> I use the word a yeah. collection of the world's biggest losers. In a lot of cases, that's really true. It's a collection of a lot of people who don't have anything. You know, don't I was watching lose, this show. Is, yeah. and, and this is this is sad. And I don't like making this kind of like it's going to probably be a mean comparison. But I'm going to make it anyway because I kind of think it, it's a, in the same ballpark. I was watching this show called 90 Day Fiance. Do you ever watch that? Oh, you ever I heard of that? Love that show. Love so that show. This did guy. Um, did you watch this season with the really loud mouth Brazilian girl? Yeah. Anyone who goes against the queen must die. Yeah. Uh, what was her name? Oh, my girlfriend's going to be so mad that I forgot her name already. 
uh, it, it was him, uh, her, and Coley, right? The 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 big fat guy, Colty. Colty, 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 Colty. So not them. So you know the the one dude from Wisconsin and his wife from Indonesia. No, but she was like super demanding. No. She had the daughter. Okay, well, this guy kind of was kind of sad. That was the only way to really describe. He was just a very sad man. Um, He just seemed uh, battered down, confused. He was divorced. You know, I he. Ugh, it's just, you know, he threw all his, everything he had in with this woman from Indonesia that he didn't really know. And, um, you know, before he was talking about his depression and he was like, I was going to go to uh, Syria to go fight with the Kurds against ISIS. I mean, on his that's, face, that's it's like, pretty noble to yeah. say, to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go spend my time. I'm going to go to Syria and fight ISIS with the Kurds. Like, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to fight? I mean, mean, obviously, I don't want to fight. I I don't want to go there and fight ISIS. Um, Yeah. I obviously don't. I I don't have any plans to go to the Middle East anytime soon. I don't have any plans to go to Rojava and join arms with the Kurds to fight ISIS. However, I've just, you could tell it was something out of like, I have nothing else to do in America. I am just lost and I need meeting. So I'm going to go fight it. You know, I'll go find meeting by going fight to the Middle East war. and fighting ISIS and fighting in a foreign war. Not He was, an, I think, a Marine prior. So he had combat mm-hmm. experience. So like, I have no meaning. So I think that's all a big element of the people who joined these militias, including ISIS and including... Um, like the guy, the, I'm going off a total tangent and I know I don't want to derail, but I think this kind of provides context. Um, the, one of the main commanders of ISIS was Georgian. Um, he was a veteran of the, uh, I believe he was a veteran of the war in Georgia. Um, but he had also linked up and had combat experience and like different like Chechen military campaigns but he had been like a normal guy um this is one of the main commanders of isis he was like a norm he wasn't an extremist um he was a christian at one point he converted to islam later in his life and he had got disgruntled because he was discharged from his art from the army and he wasn't he had like no meaning in his life and he ended up getting into like to into criminal activity and stuff like that and ended up going to jail for a couple of years and he came out when he came out of jail he came out like radicalized i think that's the the case with a lot of these people like who you know they 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 don't they don't have meeting and um uh, you know they find some greater cause whether that be some type of national nationalist movement abroad or whether that be a anti-putin movement abroad because a lot of countries have some legitimate gripes with putin um a lot of groups have some legitimate gripes uh a lot of groups have some legitimate gripes with russia um right but you know a lot of groups have legitimate gripes with everyone i mean who doesn't have a legit, legitimate gripe? But I think that, you know, when poverty and um, kind of lost, like overall being lost in life um, and your only skill is shooting someone in the face, then I think that's how you you find a lot of these situations or your only desire, not necessarily a school because a lot of these people show up untrained, but your only thing that you want to do is, or the only, you know, is, is dedicate yourself to, violence i think that's what happens so but i don't think they're so, id i don't think that all these people are ideologues like the volunteers are coming from place to place so to do um this uh this young journalist protestovich a little bit of justice and to defend him maybe that's what his situation was that's why he went to go fight with the ass maybe he was a young man looking for calling because how many fucking so nazis are there in this world <laughs> Uh, apparently a lot more now than there were in you know 20 years ago not not many but um i digress because here's another thing that i wanted to i i saw 
that was interesting about this old article. Um, a where the fuck did I see this? All right, so here's an article about them being, okay. Right sector is anti-gay. Its members like to storm pride parades with stones and batons. Okay, this isn't doing them justice. This is not making them look good. I was trying to find something that wouldn't be so off-putting, especially in Pride Month. Um, but so do many ordinary Ukrainians. Right sector is ultra-nationalist, though most of its foreign volunteers don't speak Ukrainian. At the front, all orders are related in Russian. The group's much-flaunted obsession with Stefan Bendera, the hero of the Ukrainian resistance who committed atrocities against Jews and Poles, is not much celebrated. It's not so much a celebration of Bandera, the Nazi collaborator, collaborator as Bandera, the Ukrainian hero suppressed by Russian historical conscience. So they're not celebrating the Nazi part. They're celebrating the um, resistance to Russia. Mm -hmm. Um when I asked a group of right sector sectorites in Kiev to give me a model of what they were aiming for, they cited Poland unironically. Polish nationalism, they said, was back in good health after having endured half a century of disrespect. And then again, this is the Poland that Stefan Bandera was like opposed to and tried and killed one of their foreign ministers for. And they're well, like, oh, yeah, we want to do what Poland's doing. Well, I mean, it makes sense because Poland is kind of, a, you know, they're not like a typical, uh, they're not France. Let's just put it that way. Mm. Or they're not Belgium. They're a little more right wing there. It's more of a right wing government in Poland. Just um, a little bit. The um, the right sector narrative curiously mimics that of separatists in eastern Ukraine. Both agree that the Donbass has never been Ukrainian in any meaningful cultural or historical way. So why are they fighting for? Why That's are they a good fighting question. for? Um, because why don't because they somebody separate? drew the lines and it's theirs. Of, co of course, for right sector, the Donbass must upgrade its Ukrainianness. Ukrainianness. That's the word that he uses in this article. I'm not making this up. Ukrainianness, if nationalism is to be respected, and the group has pledged to ensure this in, at any cost. Joining Reich Sector isn't difficult. You need a cell phone. And th I'm going to read this like a promo. Joining Reich Sector isn't difficult. You just need a cell phone and three to four weeks training at its camp outside Kiev, where you are taught the rudiments of street fighting. Right sector chartered buses run there daily. <laughs> right, join right sector. Um, imagine if someone just really wanted to ruin our lives and just start taking stuff out of context. It would be very easy. Yeah, it's like, um, oh, uh, I, was, I was listening to an episode of this really great podcast called Bro History, and they told me that all I needed is a cell phone and three to four weeks <laughs> off. And I could join a neo-Nazi group in Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, please don't do that. Um, traveling through Ukraine, you could be forgiven for believing that right sector is not actually a paramilitary group despised by the state. Its members march in party fatigues around since, okay, this article is just going into how much they're separated. Um, how much more do you think? Do I, I, I think we had the point, right? Yeah, totally. I think okay. we should move on to the other, the other article that you found that was, uh, interesting because, Actually, when, okay. I, when I read that you wanted to bring this up, I was pretty surprised, actually. Okay, so um, I we wanted to talk about this back a couple, of, about in April, but we postponed it for a little bit. And, you know, this journalist being arrested kind of brought it back up to the fold. However, there was this BuzzFeed article that came out on April, beginning of April, and um, it was interesting. You know, you're no, you're saying that a BuzzFeed article was interesting. That's that's a new right that's after new. reading. <laughs> um, you know, right after taking uh, which um, house I belong to, or no, which um, house in Harry Potter I belong to, um, right. quiz, quiz, or what type of uh, cat species I am. I read this article about. Nazis in Ukraine, and I've actually read this guy Christopher Miller. Um, he's been writing about this for a while. I've read his work before. He's been writing for this for at least two or three or four, maybe even longer than that. These um, 
these uh, groups in the Ukraine that have um, that are that are very far right. But his angle has always been, you know, what is our right wing nationalists from the U.S. to going there to train them. That's kind of what he writes about, which is mm-hmm. fair. Which is a fair thing. Um, I think it's fair to write about that. I think it's not fair to like you know call everyone a Nazi, which a lot of journalists and a lot of these mainstream outlets do. Um, but this article is called Soldier of Misfortune, and it's about these Americans who went abroad to fight with these right-wing nationalist groups in Ukraine um, against Russian separatists. And one of these guys comes back to the U.S. and allegedly murders two people in Florida during a gun transaction that goes wrong. And um, what happens is that he travels back to Ukraine seeking asylum, and he ends up putting Ukraine in a very awkward position because they, well, let me just quote from his article. For Ukraine, it's an issue of what to do with a man who volunteered and risked his life to defend the country and who could face capital punishment. Um, Abolished in Ukraine in 2000 if he returns to the U.S. Okay, so the Ukrainian government was like, well, you know, this guy fought for us and this guy is going to, he might die. He might be executed because Florida Mm -hmm. has a death penalty. Um, So they were kind of put in a very awkward position. Um so, man, what was the point I was trying to make? So, oh, yeah, here's the point, what I was going to say. So Ukrainians, um, they give citizenship to some of these foreign fighters who travel abroad. So they, you know, they they kind of venerate and respect the people who go and travel there and fight. Um, again, they don't really have a military. So they rely on these paramilitary volunteer armies. So they're kind of like their army. Um, but... Again, you know the the crux of the story is the is the blowback, is the is the is the blowback because um, it, it sounds a lot like Uyghurs who went to Syria to fight with ISIS to gain fighting experience for their own independence spirit movement, or and then and then they come back home and maybe they start some trouble because they want to. They want their own independence. Yeah. You know, it sounds like, um, you know, it sounds like the Afghan Arabs. You know, it sounds like, um, you know, Syrian rebels. It sounds like any, anyone who goes to uh, travel, it sounds exactly like the Afghan Arabs. You know, their explicit goal in going to the Soviet Union was to not only just fight the atheists, Soviet Union, but they wanted to learn how to fight. Because a lot of right. those Afghan Arabs, you know, Osama bin Laden's crowd, when they went over to Afghanistan to fight, um, the Muhajideen saw them as a liability for the majority of the time. Like the mm-hmm. Afghans living there were like, man, these guys are liabilities. Why? I, these guys are not bringing any value. The only value they brought was money. You know, they weren't really good fighters. They, they, were, they were green. Like most of them had never shot. Most of them were not you know, military train. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, those motherfuckers there are probably the toughest people in the goddamn world. You know, I don't think you can mm-hmm. find a society that's more fucking tough than those guys. Um, so it's a big, it's a, it's a big difference. But you know, that's this this story about this murder isn't the only story. There was that guy who was um, apparently he was going to kill a bunch of Democratic politicians, including Beto O'Rourke. Really? Who had, tr- who had traveled to Ukraine to fight with these groups. And, um, you know, he, you know, the, the FBI caught him in time, so he didn't have, you know, he obviously didn't go through with his plan, but, you know, his plan, and this, guy, this was the he guy. He was thinking about it. He was, he was, he was planning it. He was, he was planning on, on killing a bunch of, uh, democratic politicians but it's but you know that it was it's, it was thwarted um but you know the major question that i you know will want to ask you know before i uh pass out from heat exhaustion because it's probably about 95 <laughs> degrees and 1206 a.m why is the u.s giving 100 million dollars of military aid every year to a country that is officially absorbed this very radical wing 
of society into their own national guard. Like, what what is the point here? And right now, the Atlantic Council is pressuring the Biden administration to increase the military aid to five hundred million dollars a year. I saw an article um, from the Atlantic Council that was written in like two thousand. Uh, must have been written in like been like two thousand seventeen or eighteen. It was a while back, and it was like why the U.S. shouldn't deem um, you know Azov Battalion as a terrorist organization. And I was like, you know, these guys are are these guys have fucking Nazi paraf- paraphernalia on their damn uniforms, mm. like they're just showing it. Like how can you? This is this is again. Some symbols are just so poisoned. That if you're trying to make any type of outward impression to the world, then you're failing with that. Um, that's all, that's also that's also just a just to belabor that point there, Henry. It's one thing to be a Nazi and to wear Nazi symbols and to like, you know, be a Nazi by idealism. It's another thing entirely to be a Nazi who is in a paramilitary group that is actively engaging in conflict and is actively acquiring military experience in a war zone oh that's fucking scary it is and just and just to go back um you know the, the blow blowback is a real thing it's not blowback is not you know it's a made-up term that uh that, i mean libertarians mostly use it but blowback is something that's used by the cia and blowback is when you are working with a radical group and they and they cross you and they attack you, and um, or the you know the the fruits of you working with them causes harm to you. Um, but yeah, that here's here's my question because you asked a really good question. You said you said why are we giving hundreds of millions of dollars in, in aid to Ukraine if they're you know if they've officially absorbed Nazis into their uh, Nazi paramilitary groups into their national guard? And I guess my question is. You know, and this is something to explore and to to do some research on. But where is that hundred million dollars going to? Because you know, devil's advocate here. What if the money is literally going so that we they don't have to rely on neo fascist paramilitary groups and so that they can improve their own internal military? But again, it, it's kind of hard to separate the two at this point, as you point out, right? You know, uh, the the just like the Euro Maiden. Um, uh, protests got co-opted by these uh, ultra-nationalist right-wing groups. So so does a lot of the military in this. So they're almost like part and parcel with one another. It's it's very much like how you know the there might have been quote moderate rebels in Syria, but at some point, not anymore. Right? Uh, I guess my question is like, where's where's the money actually going to? Hey, listen, man, I don't understand where these moderate rebels came from. President Dr. Assad, excuse me. You call him Dr. Assad. Um, President Dr. Assad. He won by 95%. You know, how, what, who would, re- how could there be a rebellion against the guy who wins 95%? 95%. Of, I, I, I think. I, I don't know. I, ask the Belarusian dictator. I mean, president. <laughs> 95 percent. i think that is clear cut this guy is just the most popular uh president ever um i forget the reasoning i know a lot of people didn't vote i think a lot of people didn't have the uh weren't eligible to vote for this election but you know because like you know the country the parts of the country that were anti-assad are basically like not there anymore like idlib <laughs> yeah um yeah. so uh, that doesn't exist or a lot of people who left the country are not, mm-hmm. you know, who may have not liked him. So a lot of people who live there are Assad people. Like, they're Assad people who are Assad supporters. But, you know, obviously 95% is just... Uh, it's just a silly number. It's just silly. But, hey, his his father used to win by, like, 90... Like, I think one election he won by 100%, like, every single vote. I mean, that, <laughs> Oh, yeah, I got, like, 116% of the vote. No big deal. Hundred and sixteen percent of the vote. Um, yeah, people from other countries were voting for me. All right. Well, there's one thing we'd be, um, you know, remiss to not talk about this. 
we may be saying goodbye to our very good friend. And um, it's a very sad day because he's been around for, man, it seems like most of my adult, almost all of my adult life. Yeah. And um, this man is named uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And, um, you know, he seems like he R. may R. be on his way out as the prime minister of Israel. Um, we're recording this at 12, 11 a.m. on Friday morning at this point. And, um, you know, we just want to have a tribute to um, Benjamin Netanyahu and all the wonderful things and great things that he's said over the years as prime minister of Israel. And uh, we want to send him off in his, uh, in his uh, you know, blaze of glory. So Benjamin Netanyahu... No, we uh, we made this for you. What I'm about to say may surprise you, coming from the Prime Minister of Israel. But I categorically state, there is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. The three principles of winning the war on terror are the three W's. Winning, winning, and winning. The first victory in Afghanistan makes the second victory in Iraq that much easier. Uh, and therefore, I think the choice of Iraq is a good choice. It's the right choice. Yeah. Hitler didn't want to uh, exterminate the Jews at the time. He wanted to expel the Jews. And Khaj Amin al went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll all come here. So what should I do with them, he asked. He said, burn them. In the case of Iran's nuclear plans to build a bomb, this bomb has to be filled with enough enriched uranium. And Iran has to go through three stages. And by next spring, at most, by next summer, at current enrichment rates, they will have finished the medium enrichment and move on to the final stage. From there, it's only a few months, possibly a few weeks, before they get enough enriched uranium for the first bomb. They're very close. They're six months away from being about 90% of having the rich uranium for an atom bomb. I think that you have to place that red line before them now, uh, before it's, uh, it's too late. Now we're warned that within five years, North Korea could have an arsenal of 100 nuclear bombs. All right. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, we're saying goodbye to a legend. Uh, if somehow he pulls off a miracle and is still uh, prime minister by the time we release this, then we'll obviously have to eat our worms or delete this part entirely. However, um, it doesn't look good for him. All right. Um, you want to wrap this up? Yeah, man. All right. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of Bro History. Uh, We really do appreciate the time that you give us uh, listening to us uh, every week. Um, Remember to rate and review the podcast. That is the number one way to help us grow this show. Rate and review. Just go to that five-star rating uh, on your Apple device. You click on five-star rating, say, write a review, say, hey, you guys are, you guys, you guys are really cool. Super, really cool. Um, write that to the moon or, um, you know, say you guys suck and I hate you, whatever, write a review. It really does help us. Um, it really does help us grow the show. We definitely prefer the five-star review. So do that. Um, another way is that you can join our Patreon. Our Patreon is available, uh, for a dollar a month. And, um, yeah, you get a bunch of extra episodes, early releases, and you get access to our Slack account which is a very good time um slack account is where we do our communications so where we talk about stuff it's not telegram so i'm not sure if it's encrypted or not but who cares definitely not encrypted we're not plotting anything (laughs) on there but we are having fun conversation so uh join the patreon uh rate and review the podcast and um anything else that we need to add oh yeah we do have a youtube channel as well we never really talk about it but you know it's kind of like our second priority here uh with the audio podcast we do need to get more of that we're going to be posting the video part of this on youtube so um if you haven't subscribed to our youtube channel and all that stuff like videos and whatever youtubers say uh anything else 
Nope, you, you stole the part about the YouTube that I wanted to say, but we're good. <laughs> All right. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. This should be out on Sunday. So uh, have a wonderful day. Um, until next time. Thank you.